to respect institutions also. Lack of respect of institutions, honorable speaker, is sacrilegious for the person of the stature of a deputy president. For that, honorable speaker, for not respecting this parliament, this parliament and the Senate must impeach one Geoffrey Rigathi Gashwagwa tonight and we send him home so that he knows his place in this country. For those many remarks, I second Honorable Speaker and ask other members to support this question. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Order, Honorable Members on their feet, take your seats. Members on their feet, take your seats. Other members on their feet, Ruth Odinga, take your seat. Other honorable members, take your seats. Honorable members, I now propose the question, and you'll note that on the order paper, there is a long version of the motion and the abridged version of the motion. So, those of you who want to look for details, of the longer fashion, it is there. I now propose the question, which is that pursuant the provisions of Article 145 and 151B and 2 of the Constitution and Standing Order 64 and 65, this House resolves to remove from office by impeachment His Excellency Honorable Rigard Kachagua, EGH the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya on the following grounds. One, gross violation of Articles 10, 2A, B, and C, 27, 4, 73, 1A, 2, and B, 75, 1C, 129, 2 of the Constitution and Articles 147, 1, as read together with Article 131, 2C, and D of the Constitution. Two, gross violation of Articles 174, 1 and 152, 1 of the Constitution by undermining the President and the Cabinet and the effective discharge of the national government's executive mandate. Three, gross violation of Article 6, 2, 10, 2A, 174, 1861, 1891, and the fourth schedule to the Constitution by undermining devolution. Four, gross violation of Article 161 of the Constitution on the institutional and decisional independence of judges. Five, gross violation of Article 31 and 148. 5A of the Constitution on the fidelity to the oath of office and allegiance. 6. Serious reasons to believe that His Excellency the Deputy President has committed crimes under Sections 13 1A and 62 of the National Cohesion and Integration Act. 7. Serious reasons to believe that His Excellency the Deputy President has committed gross economic crimes under sections 145, 1, 46, 47, A, 3, and 48, 1 of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act, and sections 2, 3, 4, and 7 of the Proceeds of Crime and Anti-Money Laundering Act. 8. Serious reasons to believe that His Excellency the Deputy President has committed crimes by continuously misleading members of the public through false, malicious, divisive, and insightful remarks that are contrary to the provisions of Section 132 of the Penal Code and Section 29 of the Leadership and Integrity Act. Nine gross misconduct that is incompatible with the high calling and dignified status of the office of the Deputy President, a member of the Cabinet and the National Security Council. His Excellency the Deputy President has publicly attacked and undermined the work of the National Intelligence Service and its officers. Ten, gross misconduct by openly and publicly insubordinating the President 
who is the head of state and government, and 11, gross misconduct by persistently bullying state and public officers. Honorable members, the motion is supported and the list is attached by 291 members of this house. Members, before I open the debate, I received a letter from one Honorable Wandeto purporting to withdraw his signature. I want to invite the Honorable Member to read the standing orders that are very clear. Once you append your signature to a special motion, <laughs> once you append your signature on a special motion, you have crossed the Rubicon and you cannot withdraw that signature. Honorable Otienda Molo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, sh shall I use the dispatch with your permission? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this special motion is unprecedented but contemplated by the Constitution, and I support it. Let it be a lesson, Mr. Speaker, that be you ever so high, the Constitution is still above you. Mr. Speaker, some have told me and have told us that this is not our war. But, Mr. Speaker, they do not know that in circumstances of combat, a bystander is at greater risk than a combatant. You must choose your side. And I've chosen, Mr. Speaker, after listening to the display of jingoism by the Deputy President, after listening to the self-entitlement for two and a half hours, after listening to the disdain of governance institutions, this parliament and the courts, after listening to the DP threatening that parliament and the courts should know that you it's not easy to remove a deputy president who had 7.2 million votes. Mr. Speaker, after treating Kenyans as fools by trying to mislead on the intent and purpose of his utterances on the idea of government being a company, it was easy for me to make a decision to cast my lot with impeachment of the deputy president. Mr. Speaker, there can be much to say on the reasons. It is easy for example, Mr. Speaker, to talk about the confessions of the Deputy President regarding 600 million that his son under 30 years was able to acquire. And he says, without tabling any evidence, that it was acquired from a bank. But he admits, Mr. Speaker, more importantly, two things. One, that the property in issue was government property, irregularly acquired without the usual procurement processes. He also admits, Mr. Speaker, that the son was able to be given, you know, a moratorium of one year not to pay anything while enjoying the proceeds. And the DP thinks there's nothing wrong with that. It is for good reason that the anti-corruption laws in this country do not limit themselves to the individual. They go to the spouse and the children. It is for such reasons. Mr. Speaker, it is also interesting that the DP admits to abuse of office. How does he do that? The DP admits to abuse of office on the issue of KEMSA. It is important, and this bears repetition, that the evidence tabled by the Honorable Mutuse includes an affidavit by Dr. Mulwa. That affidavit at paragraph 5 is very instructive, and it says that the DP's phone calls was aimed at interfering and covering procurement irregularities. 
and that is on an, a direct affidavit. But more importantly, if you look at page 69, you will see the SMSs. And that SMS, the son of the deputy president, Dr. Ikinu Rigadi, has the courage to say that there is a document for his excellency we are trying to collect, not for himself, not for any other company, for his excellency. <laughs> and the fact, Mr. Speaker, that the DP admits to these processes and sees nothing wrong with it is a very serious matter of integrity. But Mr. Speaker, I'll not speak to all those two. I'll speak to a more fundamental fact. The blatant justification of discrimination and insightful utterances against Kenyans. That is where I want to focus, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in this, the DP and their have gone through the documents, there are various clips where the DP repeats this, that Kenya is a company and those who did not vote for Kenya Kwanzaa are not entitled to enjoy the proceeds from that company. What worries me, Mr. Speaker, is that with a straight face, the DP could appear on live television and justify these utterances. How does he justify it? He says that he is entitled to do that because there are some partisan political agreements or promises that were made. What does that mean? The DP elevates promises at a political party level above the National Cohesion and Integration Act, Section 13. He elevates those promises at a political party level are above the constitution of Kenya. There are 15 different articles that speaks against this. The fact that the DP can think that he can justify such utterances and elevate these agreements above the law and the constitution is the clearest evidence that he must go because he has breached the constitution. It is important to note that Article 145.1a and C do not say that if you are respecting a political promise, then you can breach the Constitution. If that was to be the case, Article 24 would include that as a, as a limitation. It does not include. If you want one reason, members, to impeach the, uh, the Deputy President is because he has admitted to breaching the Constitution on account of a political promise. Mr. Speaker, Article 145.1b is another interesting one, and it speaks to reasonable, uh, serious reasons to believe that the DP has breached the Constitution. You do not need the hard evidence. Members, remember, for conviction, that is for courts. We are not a court of law. Ours is to look at the evidence and see if there's a serious and reasons to believe those serious reasons speak to integrity. They speak to impropriety. And if you look at them and then find that there's some impropriety, then ground seven will have been proved. Ground seven talks of the issue of acquired property coming to 5.2 billion. What struck me, Mr. Speaker, is that the deputy president took one and a half hours to explain why he's not corrupt. Of the two and a half hours, 90 minutes was to explain why he is not corrupt. The very fact that you take 90 minutes to explain you are not corrupt is prima facie evidence of corruption. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, for one who is not corrupt, you can explain it in a sentence, period. To take 90 minutes is in itself prima facie evidence that there's corruption. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, on the cancer issue, other than the affidavit and their interference, the, the affidavit, the, the DP then admits interference. Whoever advised the DP to do that live interview could not have had his interest at heart, but has made our work much the easier. Because now there are self-incriminations, confessions, and admissions that we can work with. Mr. Speaker, it is clear from yesterday's presentation that the deputy president can no longer deputize the president. The role of any deputy under the constitution is to deputize. Mr. Speaker, I crave for just two more minutes.
so order. that Mr. Speaker, even the fact, Mr. Speaker, it is not a ground of the impeachment by Honorable Mwangi Mutuse, but it has become a clear ground from yesterday's interview that the DP is incapable of deputizing the president. And if we needed an independent ground, that is very clear. It is also clear that the DP can no longer be part of a cabinet. It is a basic rule in terms of labor law. If you cannot work with your boss, if you be cannot if be insubordinate your boss, if one person is to go, is the subordinate, not the boss. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I want to just close by addressing one issue, and it bears address. Some Kenyans, hello, uh, Mr. Speaker, it is important to address this issue. Some Kenyans want us to divert attention from the impeachment that is before us. There is only one impeachment motion before us, and it's in respect of the Deputy President. Now, some people have said, Kufa Makanga, Kufa Dereva. Now, let me explain to you. First of all, when you say Kufa Dereva, Kufa Makanga, you must remember that in that bus there are passengers. Yeah. And those passengers can die if you are reckless. Yeah. In this case, those passengers are Kenyans. Yeah. We as parliament must navigate that issue so carefully that the passengers called Kenyans remain safe. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that is extremely important. Why? We are in a very unique position where we have a president and a deputy president, but we do not have an IBC. If anything happens right now, as we are going to, we, if we impeach the deputy president as we want to, as we need to, the position can be filled even without an IBC. But if there is no president and there is no deputy president, only the speaker can act for 60 days. Within those 60 days, there must be an election. We cannot currently have an election because we have no IBC. To have IBC commissioners, you need a president to nominate the, the board that will select them. Once the board is nominated and they propose a name, then the name must be forwarded again to us, and it's only the president who can nominate them. In other words, if you say Kufa Dereva, Kufa Makanga, you want absolute turmoil for all the Kenyans to die in that accident. That would be a very reckless act. Mr. Speaker, I am convinced, having looked at the Deputy President, having listened to him, that the Deputy President is not remorseful. He is not sorry for any utterances. He is not prepared to change. He is a man who must be saved from himself by impeachment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I support. George Order. George Morogara. <laughs> oh, order, 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 honorable members, order, order, Ben Suda, freeze, freeze where order. you are. Order, members. Order, honorable members. I know the limits of exuberance are high. Apple. Order. Beatrice, freeze where you are. I know the levels of exuberance are high, but let's listen to those who are speaking. There's a lot of requests to speak, and I did tell you that in a motion such as this, Dr. Bukose will not ask to pull the question. <laughs> So let's listen to each other. Of course, the canned and burnt of debate uh, cannot be ruled out in uh, acknowledging good issues and uh, disagreeing, but let's have some decorum. Those of you who speak, you have five minutes. If you can finish earlier, the better, so that many more can speak. Go on, uh, Murugara. <coughs> and members, when you are given uh, permission to, uh, to speak, if you wish to come to the dispatch box, do so. If you want to speak from where you are, do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, before I even state my position as regards this motion, it is important for me to express what the views of Kenyans are regarding this motion, and especially with a hindsight of the public participation that we did, and also from the public opinion which was communicated to Kenyans through an agency that conducts opinion polls. It is vitally important to remind Kenyans that through the public participation that we did on Friday and Saturday, it was overwhelming that Kenyans were in approval of the motion and therefore we must respect their position. We must also remind Kenyans that an agency by the name TIFA has come up with an opinion polling which again has indicated that Kenyans are in favor of the motion. Therefore, even as we debate today, even as we agonize over this motion, even as we consult the Honorable Wengi Mutuse, as we have done from time to time, as regards this motion, it is quite clear that Kenyans are in favor of the motion carrying the day. I therefore respect the position of Kenyans, I respect the position of my constituents of the Raqqa, and I do confirm that I rise to support the motion. That today, the motion that has been brought to this house to have His Excellency the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, the Honorable Rigathi Gachagwa, impeached, carries the day by a vote to be taken by the House. I must commend the Honorable Mwengi Mutuse, who is actually my Vice Chairperson in Justice and Legal Affairs Committee, for work excellently done. And repeat the position he has made, that we are not a court of law trying a suspect. We are a House of Parliament which is required to just consider whether the grounds advanced are actually substantiated. Do we have reasons to believe that the grounds advanced are substantiated? Having listened to the mover, having looked at the documentation, and I confess we have burnt midnight oil looking at this particular motion and the supporting documentation. These grounds are substantiated. Allow me briefly to just mention but a few. Ground number one, which is on dangerous divisions in the country, is propagated by the Deputy President. The Deputy President last night admitted and tried to qualify the admission that he had likened Kenya to a company. There is total difference between likening the government to a company and stating categorically that the government is actually a company. The deputy president in the clips we have watched was candid in a statement to Kenyans that the government is actually a company and that each one of us has or does not have shares in that company. The net effect of this is if you do not have shares, then you do not belong to Kenya. If you have shares, then you are more Kenyan than any other person who has lesser shares than you. This is the dangerous division which this house must frown against. And it must hold squarely against the deputy president. The second admission he made, which is a very strong ground of this motion, is breach of collective responsibility. It has been clearly stated that the cabinet includes the deputy president. The president is the principal, the deputy president is the principal assistant of the president. 
having breached this doctrine of collective responsibility. And he clearly said he did so because he thought, in his view, in his opinion, it was unconstitutional to have decided the way they decided. Clearly shows that the deputy president is not able to work with the government in which he is mandated to work with. To have actually failed to assist the president so that you speak contra to what the president says is itself in subordination as we have actually been told. The net effect is that even if the deputy president was actually to survive this impeachment motion, our question is, where would he work? He cannot work with the president because he made another admission that this motion actually has the nod of the president. We have not had any PG. We have had no meetings whatsoever regarding this motion, but he is convinced that the president has a hand in this motion. If that is the case and he survives, who will he work with? Who will be his boss? Number two, he says whatever they do in the cabinet tinkers on the unconstitutionality. If that is what his position is, that the cabinet as it sits today would actually make decisions, which decisions they would have to execute at one time or the other, which are unconstitutional, which cabinet will he work with. Therefore, it goes without gain saying that the personality of the deputy president, His Excellency Rigadi Gachewa, is untenable as far as the presidency is concerned and as far as the cabinet is concerned. One minute more. There has been an argument regarding the companies and Honorable Mutuse has read out the companies which nobody seems to know exactly why these companies were formed. Exactly what was the ulterior motive of forming these companies. But what I wish to point out regarding the companies and what Kenyans should know is that some of the properties under which the deputy president aid stating that these were properties of his late brother, are actually today his properties. Most important is a property known as Kuruwitu Home Resort. This property was actually sold to another company known as Kuruwitu Properties Limited, for Kenya shillings, 250,000. A search of these companies indicate that Kuruwito Properties Limited is owned by Vipigo Beach Resort Limited and John Y. Madenge. We therefore have to ask ourselves, who is Vipigo Beach Resort Limited? And CR12 indicates that this company is actually owned in shares by Keith Ekino Rigathi, Kevin Gashagwa Rigathi, the estate of the deceased James Deritu Gashagwa. As we were told, these two persons named Keith and Kevin are not executors of the estate of the late Deritu Gashagwa. So if they actually own this company, which owns one of the properties of the deceased purchased at Kenya Shillings, 250 million, then it goes without gain saying that, that in fact the deputy president has an explanation to give regarding this. Finally, we've been told about the press statement he made in Mombasa, and this is the evidence of insubordination. The country was on fire, the country was burning. The president actually finished or completed giving what measures he would take to restore the country. The deputy president went to Mombasa where he gave a statement which in itself was inciting to Kenyans. Casting aspersions on the government, casting aspersions on our agencies and at the end of the day we have also seen him casting aspersions on 
the judiciary, which is supposed to be an independent institution. What we are required to do as members of parliament is to prove only one ground. The rest of them may fall or may succeed. But I can assure you, out of the 11 grounds, there is cogent evidence that the deputy president has committed acts inconsistent with his office. Acts which in themselves warrant this house to impeach him today as we go to the vote. As I conclude, I urge the house, let us look at the bigger picture, which is the bigger picture of Kenya as a country. What we are doing is not to try and appease one person. We are trying to do this so that the country is saved. And we have always asked the question, the second in command, who does not work with the first in command and his team? Of what use would that person be to the country? With those very many remarks, I do beg to support this motion. Thank you. Mishimbogo. Give her the mic. Asante sana mwishimiwa speaker. Mwishimiwa speaker na smama hapa. Kuunga mkono hoja hii ya kumungatua mamlakani na ibu wa raisi wana rigathi gachagwa. Na naunga mkono kwa sababu katiba yetu kifungu mia msini na tisa imetupatia sababu muafaka za kuweza kumungatua na ibu wa raisi. Na sababu ya kwanza imezungumzia kukeuka katiba. Na nikiangalia mwishimiwa rigathi gachagwa amekeuka katiba haswa nikiangalia kipengele cha kumi ambacho kinazungumzia maadili ya kitaifa maadili ya kitaifa ikiwemo umoja ikiwemo demokrasia ikiwemo usawa mara nyingi sana amezungumzia mambo ya kwamba nchi yetu ni kama kampuni na ni ya washikadau na amesema ya kwamba washikadau hawa ni wale ambao tu wamepiga kura katika serikali ya Kenya kwanza hivyo basi kukiuka maadili katika kifungu cha kumi kwa sababu tunajua wa Kenya wote wanalipa ushuru na wakenya wote wana haki sawia wale waliopiga kura kwa serikali na wale ambao pia walikuwa katika upande ule mwingine kwa sababu ni demokrasia unaweza kuwa upande wa serikali na unaweza kuwa upande wa upinzani vile vile pia tunaona katika kifungu 147 kinasema ya kwamba yeye atakuwa ni msaidizi mkuu wa rais katika serikali na msaidizi mkuu pia atakuwa ni naibu katika zile zile kazi ambazo rais anazifanya lakini je vitendo vyake vimeonyesha mambo hayo vitendo vimeonyesha ya kwamba yeye si msaidizi kuna wakati ule wajenzi wakati rais ametoa hotuba hapa Nairobi ya kutoa mwelekeo wa kitaifa na jambo lile yeye alikuwa Mombasa akitoa hotuba ambayo ilikuwa inazungumza tofauti na ile hotuba ya rais na hapo pia kati ya fitina katika taasisi zetu za kiserikali na kumlaumu bwana Nurdin Haji kwa hivyo imeonyesha ya kwamba yeye ni kama anachukua nafasi ile ya uri ya rais hachukui ile nafasi ya kwamba yeye ni msaidizi vile vile pia tumeona ya kwamba naibu wa rais amekiuka katiba na kuwa amezungumzia utovu wa nidhamu kwa hali ya juu ile kiingereza tunasema gross misconduct kwa mfano aliita mmoja wetu mheshimiwa jematia na kumuita malaya unapoita mwanamke yoyote malaya umeita wana wa mama wote wa Kenya malaya sisi si malaya sisi ni kina mama na sisi ni viongozi hatuwezi tukakubali naibu wa rais kutuita malaya akarudi akasema hao wa mama wa Mount Kenya ambao wako pamoja ni na mimi hawa ni wa mama wote ni wa mama wa rais hawa ni wa mama wake alikuwa anamaanisha nini Mwishimiwa rigathi gachagua huna ishima kwa kina mama wa taifa hili la Kenya vile vile katika huo utovu wa nidhamu tunaona sehemu ya Nyandarwa alinunua shamba ambalo kina mama walikuwa wamelima mahindi wamelima viazi wamelima zile mushiri alimweka pale MCA 
na wakavunja wakavunja wakavuruga hiyo chakula yote angekuwa yeye ana hekima kama kiongozi angeacha vikue watu wavune alafu achukue hilo shamba lakini ni kwamba hana nidhamu na wala hana kufikiria wa Kenya kama naibu wa rais na wala hana ubinadamu vile vile pia sababu nyingine inakuwa ya kwamba ukikosa ufanisi Kiingereza incompetence na mimi nataka niseme alikosa ufanisi kwa sababu alisema anapigana na pombe haramu na anapigana na madawa ya kulevya akaja kule pwani kazi aliyofanya kubwa ni kutukana viongozi kusema anajua waliona wanauza miadarati atawataja atawashika aliwataja aliwashika miadarati iko ama hakuna na hii pombe haramu iko mlima peke yake ama pia iko kule magharibi iko kule sehemu ya Nyanza na iko hata hapa Nairobi tumuulize yale mamilioni ambayo ameyatumia kwa hiyo kazi yametupatia natija gani yamefanya faida gani isipokuwa kunyakuwa ardhi akiandika kwa jina la mke wake ati atatengeza sehemu za kuweza kunasua vijana kwa jambo hilo jambo jengine ni kashfa ya kemsa imezungumziwa vizuri sana vile alivyowezesha watoto wake na makampuni yake na kuiba pesa zile katika kashfa hiyo hatuwezi kuwa na naibu wa rais ambaye juzi na jana alikuwa milioni mia nane yani kama mali yake hivi karibuni ati ni ni, 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 ni bilioni tano nukta mbili kwa muda mchache tu pesa hizo umezipata wapi pia umedhulumu bibi wawili wa marehemu ndugu yako aliyekuwa gavana wa Nyeri utakuwaje upewe flati kumi na wao wapewe tano na ni wawili na kuna na watoto jamani ni sheria gani tunao sheria ile ya Kiingereza Give her one minute Tunajua hiyo sheria imezungumzia wakati mume amekufa yani ni mabibi na watoto ndio wana urithi sasa wewe itakuwaje uchukue huo urithi wote mpaka hoteli umechukua ati uliandikiwa ati ndugu yako alikupa jamani jamani wewe kama makamu wa rais muogope Mwenyezi Mungu na ujue ya kwamba hatuko hapa sisi katika ukabila tukiangalia act ile ya National Cohesion Integration Act inazungumzia yoyote atakayetumia maneno ya matusi maneno ya kutishia ili kuweza kuleta Buda katika makabila yeye yeah, anatakikana ashtakiwe na amefanya makosa. Rwanda juzi na jana matamshi ya kikabila yaliwatia katika vita vikali vya kikabila. Na wewe leo unataka kuleta vita katika taifa la Kenya. Tuliona molo clashes na hata wewe unasemekana ulikuwa kwa hiyo maneno. Tuliona ka... Time up. Time up Mishi. Faith Gitau. Um, thank you honorable speaker for according me this opportunity and from the onset I support this special motion first our supreme law of the land expects the presidency which includes the president and the deputy to be a symbol of national unity in that case the holders of that office are expected to portray a national image as opposed to an ethnic outlook. Honorable Speaker, our Deputy President has been at the forefront in advancing a selfish ethnic agenda. For him, it is about his community and nothing more. After an election uh, mr speaker the government has to serve both those who voted for it and those who did not it was wrong for the deputy president to advocate for shareholding in order to discriminate against the rest of the communities which may create ethnic um, animosity against Mount Kenya region. As a county member of parliament, I think I have traversed this nation more 
than the deputy president. Secondly, honorable speaker, the deputy president, as the second in command, should act as a father figure to members of parliament and uh, the community at large. Far from it, the deputy president, during his tenure, has been divisive and very egocentric. For him, it is about me, myself, and I. It is unfortunate that he has lowered the status and respect expected of such high office. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, when we went to the people urging them to elect this government, we gave them an undertaking that women must be respected. It is therefore, it disturbs me so greatly when the deputy president is at the forefront demeaning women in leadership, particularly those he perceives his enemies. He has no respect for women whatsoever. He has made a scathing public attacks on a woman high court judge. And in addition, he has been attacking women and especially members of parliament, me and others included in this house. And therefore, he can never and he has no respect for women and he can never work with women. And for, for those few remarks, I support. Makali Mulu. Yeah, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for this opportunity. Honorable Speaker, I want to say the following. Impeachment of a Deputy President is a matter of national interest and international interest, and is on the basis of that, Honorable Speaker, that people have to be very careful with what they do with the, this impeachment. Honorable Speaker, I want to remind the House that we are only one of the many parts of the process. This National Assembly will be making their decision. From there, we'll go to the Senate. And there's also the, the courts, if need be. And this is on the basis of that, Honorable Speaker, that we must isolate personal issues from issues which make sense to Kenyans. So that, Honorable Speaker, we don't, as a house, go for what I'll call mob justice mentality, and at the end of the day, the other stages, we lose it. Honorable Speaker, in the past, this house has been thrown under the bus because of this kind of mentality, where we go, make decisions, and out there, when they go to the courts, a number of our acts of parliament have been declared unconstitutional, basically because as members, we come here and we start shouting and assuming that other people there are not watching. Or speak out what am I saying? I've listened to the grounds of this motion, this impeachment motion, and I've listened to my friend, Honorable Mutuse, making the presentation and trying to justify some of these grounds, Honorable Speaker. I want to pick a few of them and ask myself whether they really they meet the expectations in terms of saying that the DP should be beached on those grounds. The first one, Honorable Speaker, is the issue of demolitions. In this country, Honorable Speaker, when you go to our constitution, it clearly says that Kenyans have a right. They have their own rights. And if the government has made a decision to carry out demolitions, looking at the hierarchy in terms of governance, the topmost person in terms of hierarchy is the president, is not the deputy president. So in a situation where a decision is made, and the deputy president doesn't say, says he doesn't support it, the question is, should you be harassing the deputy president or the president? Because the person who took the oath as the head of the executive is the president or the deputy president. So on the basis of those demolitions, Honorable Speaker, it is going to be very unfair 
to start saying it is the deputy president who is in supporting the president because at the end of the day, whose decision did, did carry the day? That's the question. The second issue, Honorable Speaker, is the issue of shareholding. Honorable members, let's be very honest with ourselves. We are all politicians. We have been voted in. We represent the constituencies. How many of you can say that you, have no, you are not practicing what is being explained in this motion? How many? Let's be very honest with ourselves. Let's be very honest with ourselves that most of you, majority of you, are doing exactly what is being said in this motion. It's only that don't say it publicly. That's the truth of the matter, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker. Yes, uh, Honorable Honorable Speaker. Molo, there's a point of order. Yeah, I have no problem, Honorable Speaker. Yeah. I hope I'll be yes, saving my time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, my name is Steve Mogaka from West Mogrango. Is the member on the floor in order to speak about what I practice? What does he know about what I practice? Can he restrict himself to what he does and not start uh, uh, throwing us passions on members of parliament as if he is in their minds and he is in their practice, as he is not? Is he not out of order? Yes, uh, Makali. Honorable Speaker, I really don't see any point of order there. I get on to proceed. Honorable Speaker, the issue of the judicial officer, who is being accused yes, as one of the grounds for this. Honorable Speaker. Order, Makali. And Honorable Speaker. There's another point of order another here. point of order. Take your seat. Yeah. Give uh, Farah the mic. Mr. Speaker, is the Honorable Makali somebody I have a lot of respect for. In order to compare a member of parliament who represents a constituency and the functions of that member and somebody who is the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya who represents the four corners of this country and say that because the members of parliament go and develop, uh, uh, my presumption is that he thinks the CDF funds for one constituency cannot be taken to another constituency. But that's a different thing when it comes to national resources and the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya. Makali, wind up, your time is up. You know, you know, Honorable Speaker, I hope this is not just to drive me to not to say what I wanted to say, Honorable Speaker. I can see a very deliberate move to curtail me from saying what I want to say. Do you want Honorable Speaker, from Nimrod by? Honorable Speaker, you know the thing is, Honorable Speaker, and Honorable Speaker, you need to protect me on a serious. You have been protecting everybody who you has spoken. Unless also, also, Honorable Speaker, you're on the same side of those who are supporting. Or, or, because or, on a serious, Honorable Speaker, or, or I don't think it's fair. You have been protecting everybody else. You can't protect. Order, Honorable Makali Mulu. Order, Honorable Makali Mulu. You've been sitting here since we started. Order, Makali. Not a single previous speaker attracted a single point of order. If any came, the speaker will allow it. Not a single person raised a point of order. In fact, I'm being gracious by asking you, Nimrod Mbai wants to inform you, do you want this information? If you don't want it, you go on. But for you, order Makali Mulu. You know, when you lose, when you lose your cool, you also lose the argument. So just be composed, say your bit. The speaker has no dog in this fight. Just say what you want to say, finish, and we give space to somebody else. And any member who wants to stand on a point of order, it's in within your standing orders. He has said he doesn't want your information. Go on. You, you, you know, Honorable Speaker, with all due respect, people have been making their, their, their contribution here since morning. Nobody has been shouting point of order. So, and it's, it's, it's my democratic... It's my democratic position to oppose the motion. Order. Honorable Speaker. On. Honorable Speaker, I've been elected by the people of Kitui Central to come to this house three times. And nobody can, can assume that I cannot make my contribution. Honorable Speaker, I've been saying, on the matter of judicial officer. Wind up. The judicial officer has been accused of corruption in related matters, Honorable Speaker. And there is a court case, or as we are speaking. Are we running away from accountability as a country? When do we allow the courts to do their work up to the conclusion? That as a house, we want to make this as a ground for impeachment, Honorable Speaker. This is what we are saying. There is separation of power, Honorable Speaker, and we should respect that. 
Serving honorable speaker, the ND of officers has been called by the DP. Just called. How many of us here since morning have been called by the president? How many of us here since morning have been called by the deputy president? Pleading with us to either support or oppose. Can you be bitched on that note? On a serious note, we need to be I'm saying, honorable speaker, from where we are seated as a house, you go for mob, mob justice mentality, you lose it at the top there, you are trying to reduce the credibility of this house to the lowest. grounds for opposition of this motion. Is it a situation where a thief has been sent to, court to, to catch another thief? This is a situation. Honorable Speaker, this country has much more e serious issues than what we are discussing. Mike Trisi... Your time is up. Order. I will now order. Take your seats. Order. Robert Mbai. Boy. Order, oh, Robert Mbui. Give him one minute to finish. Yeah, Honorable Speaker. So I was saying, Honorable Speaker, Kenyans have said that Kitrisi and in particular has said, Kufa Makanga, Kufa Ndereva, Kufa Mechanic. Because Kenyans are more serious issues. And when they die, we want a new re renewal of this country, Honorable Speaker. This idea of mob justice, we are not going to allow it in this country. Kenyans have more serious things. I op oppose, Honorable Speaker. Mele Odiambo to speak to the <laughs> public participation report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me this opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I was just wondering if after speaking to the public participation that I could also just make my contribution. You have 15 minutes within which you have to speak to all those. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'll try. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, earlier on in the morning, I had uh, laid before the uh, table before the house. Um, I am. Uh, uh, is it uh, vertically challenged? You are loud enough. Go on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I was indicating that earlier in the morning I had uh, uh, presented a report of a public participation on the proposed removal from office by impeachment of His Excellency Rigadi Gachagua, EGH, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. Honorable uh, Speaker, this is following the notice of a special motion by Honorable Mwengi Mutuse and in line with Article 1182 of the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, uh, consequently, the House Business Committee approved a public participation program across all 290 constituencies and I present on behalf of the House Business Committee. Mr. Speaker, I'll speak to the issue of the legal framework of public participation. And Mr. Speaker, Article 102 of the Constitution provides for the participation of the people as one of the national values and principles of governance. Mr. Speaker, um, Again, uh, Article 118 of the Constitution requires Parliament to ensure public access and participation of the people in its affairs. I will not go to the details, and we can read it for ourselves because of time. Mr. Speaker, I wish to note from, on my own behalf that in uh, quasi-judicial proceedings like this, public participation is not really necessary even though the courts have pronounced that they are. In my view, they are not actually necessary in quasi-judicial uh, processes like this, because, Mr. Speaker, it's almost like saying that the judiciary needs public participation in making their decision. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, I also want to speak to the issue of timelines. And, Mr. Speaker, Parliament has spoken very clearly on the issue of, of timelines, understanding Order 64-2, and in summary, Mr. Speaker, I would want to say, if you read the standing order, that there are very strict timelines uh, for um, a process or a motion like this. And Mr. Speaker, in setting the period, the National Assembly was guided by the need to preserve the overarching constitutional principle of acting without unreasonable delay. The special motion for removal from office by impeachment of the deputy president was therefore processed in accordance with the timeline sets out understanding order 
uh, 64. Mr. Speaker, in buttressing the necessity for expedited consideration of special motions, previous speakers of the National Assembly of Kenya expressed themselves on the question of timelines for considering special motions by the House when the special motions were filed proposing the removal by impeachment of the then cabinet secretaries, Honorable uh, Anu Waiguru, Honorable Jens Masharia, Honorable Kaimeni, and more recently, Honorable Midika Linturi. In all the foregoing instances, uh, the speaker emphasized the need to dispose of a special motion as soon as is practicable uh, to remove the anxiety of hangman's noose from the neck of a state officer proposed for impeachment. Mr. Speaker, you have seen the level of anxiety that the deputy president has undergone. And indeed, when he was actually giving the press statement yesterday, he was almost in tears. And that is why the House hastens the process so that the emotional turmoil is lessened having uh, gone uh, uh, through this process, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the clerk of the National Assembly published advertisements on the 23rd, oh, sorry, on the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of October and invited written submissions via hand delivery, post, or email until the 5th of October 2024. Mr. Speaker, all these were also ad advertised on the 4th of October and extended to the 5th in each constituency. To assist in this exercise, a public view template was made available to the public in both English and Kiswahili to guide submissions. On the 3rd and 4th of October 2024, 40,000 copies of the public view templates were also circulated as newspaper pullouts. This template was designated to provide clarity and precision in responses, whether for or against the motion, number two, to supplement other means of public input, and three, to ensure both qualitative and quantitative feedback was captured, which is actually as has been directed by the courts in the past. Mr. Speaker, I just want to indicate that many, many uh, for, uh, means were used, including radio, TV, and other means to publicize this process, including Twitter or formerly, um, currently X or formerly Twitter and Facebook pages. Mr. Speaker, the public was invited to submit views either in support or in opposition of the special mo motion or offer other views. Mr. Speaker, I wish to laud Kenyans for their growing consciousness on their civic rights and duties. Mr. Speaker, people participated in various ways, various ways, as was witnessed both on electronic and social media, Mr. Speaker. Um, and Mr. Speaker, many Kenyans who are participating participated very expressively. Mr. Speaker, I think many of us saw people expressing their, um, their views in many, many ways, some of which I will explain later. However, Mr. Speaker, by the nature of news making, we saw the areas where the views were expressive, but much less in the areas where the views were not that expressive. Mr. Speaker, if you look at the report, and I want to download the parliamentary uh, team, they have even captured photos of uh, members of the public giving their views in constituencies very peacefully. But Mr. Speaker, as I want to repeat, that by the very nature of news making, what we will see are the dramatic scenes. And those we saw, I don't think it is shame as such, it's their right and uh, they can share. Mr. Speaker, I wish to indicate uh, that, I wish to report that over, based on all that, over 200,000 responses were received, of which 65.1% supported the motion, while 33.81% opposed the motion, and 1.09% offered neutral or other alternative views. 
Mr. Speaker, some of the members in contributing have actually alluded to some of those alternative views. I've heard uh, the speaker right before me talking about the issue that Kenya has very many pressing issues. Mr. Speaker, indeed it is true, Kenya has many pressing issues, and as a house, we are already seized of those issues and are indeed already dealing with some of those issues. One of those issues that the parliament has raised is the issue of education, the education system, and we have called the CS for education more than two times to deal with that issue. Again, on the health issue, we have also invited the CS for health amongst other officials. So indeed, the House can chew and walk at the same time. Mr. Speaker, when a motion is brought of this magnitude, Parliament, by its own standing orders, must stop everything else and give priority to this motion. And that is why Parliament stopped all its business on Thursday and focused on this, and all members of Parliament went to their constituencies to deal with this issue. Mr. Speaker, I wish to indicate that uh, given that this is a very special uh, public participation process, a first of its kind, Mr. Speaker, since the Constitution was uh, promulgated, there were some challenges, but which did not affect the overall product of public participation. Mr. Speaker, some of those challenges were as follows. Mr. Speaker, there was political interference at public forums such as Bomas of Kenya and Muranga. Mr. Speaker, there was violent disruptions in areas like Olkalau, Kipipiri, and Nyeri Town. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there was incomplete or unclear submission, including forms without identifying information or contradictory responses. Mr. Speaker, there was low turnout in some constituencies due to insecurity, such as in Bora. Mr. Speaker, public expectation for monetary compensation for participation was also experienced. Mr. Speaker, there was late submission of forms and memorandum in some instances. There were threats of violence towards officers and inappropriate language in some email submissions. And Mr. Speaker, there was pressure from some constituencies such as Olkalau and Kipipiri for officers to declare results prematurely. On the whole, Mr. Speaker, most places in the country went on uninterrupted. And the results that I just indicated to you Mr. Speaker, are based on that. Mr. Speaker, because of time, and I would like other members to speak, I would want to invite members to look at the report that has been tabled by the House Business Committee. Mr. Speaker, I'll just speak very briefly on my own account. Mr. Speaker, I wish to indicate on my own account as a member of Suba North constituency that what we are going through post-2010 constitution I want to agree with uh, the honorable member that has spoken and said that it's a very important process because indeed it is. Mr. Speaker, it is a defining moment constitutionally and a first of its kind since 2010. It is both a legal and a political process. Mr. Speaker, the Supreme Court in the Sonko's case confirmed that impeachment is not just about civil liability or criminal culp culpability but it's about accountability, political governance, as well as policy and political responsibility. Mr. Speaker, I'll speak very briefly to that in the end, but I want to speak to the issue of grounds. I'll be very brief, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there are three grounds that have been given under Article 150 of the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, I want to speak to the issue the third ground, which is gross misconduct. Mr. Speaker, I have actually looked at the Constitution and there is no definition of gross misconduct. I have looked at our laws and there is no definition of gross misconduct. 
Mr. Speaker, Black's Law Dictionary defines gross misconduct as a dereliction of duty, unlawful or improper behavior. Mr. Speaker, on that account alone, virtually every ground that has been stipulated here would amount to gross misconduct. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, speaking as a governance expert, perhaps it's one of the areas we may want to change in future in the Constitution. Because I was saddened when Nancy Baraza was removed from office for just touching somebody's nose only. Even pinching, yeah? Touching somebody's nose. So, Mr. Speaker, what I would like to say, Mr. Speaker, is based on this grounds, it is easy to impeach. Mr. Speaker, if you just add me one minute, please. Mr. Speaker. Okay, you have one and a half. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would just want to say that I've been very, I'm by nature, I know I'm a very tough person, but by very, very nature, I'm also very empathetic. And I've been sympathizing a lot with the Deputy Speaker, especially, well, Deputy President, sorry, especially when he prays, because I'm also a prayerful person. But Mr. Speaker, I would want the Deputy Speaker to learn from this. Deputy President. Sorry, Deputy President. Sorry, I don't know why I keep going to Honorable Gladys. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in my book, which I've just released, Rigo Berigd, Principle 9, the power of words, taming the tongue. Mr. Speaker, if the deputy president had been quiet, he would have carried many people in this house. But he did not tame the tongue. And every time he spoke, he's just showing further and further division of the country. And I feel sad as a country that many people, even my friends, because I have many friends in central Kenya, who are calling me, are not calling me from a governance perspective. They are telling me, please save us Mount Kenya. Mr. Speaker, when will we ever reach a point as a country when we look at governance issues and not ethnic parochial issues that have divided the country for a long time, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I do empathize with the Deputy President and I wish the hand he extended to the President he had done it much earlier. Mr. Speaker, I hope he learns from the experience of Corellinius of ancient Rome, who had won many battles, and his fame preceded him. But when he got into his, in politics, his mouth brought him down. Mr. Speaker, I support. Gladys Shalei, not information, there's no one on the floor. Speak, you wanted to speak. Okay, but just allow me to correct one issue that has been raised twice on the issue of Nancy Barraza. Nancy Barraza was alleged to have pinched the nose of someone. It was never confirmed. There was the CCTV footage did not reveal it, and she was found with no guilt on that point. So as a woman leader, I want to correct that. Nancy Barraza served this country faithfully. So let us correct the Hansard. Thank you. Honorable Speaker, I can proceed. Thanks, Gladys. Go on. Yes, I am. Okay. Honorable Speaker, thank you very much. And again, uh, before I proceed to support this motion, allow me to clarify just one issue. I have been accused by the Deputy President of bias, indicating that I cannot preside over this impeachment proceedings because I am biased. I want to confirm that when Okay, thank you. I want to confirm that I'm not biased at all. When I made the statements that I did make, I made them as member of parliament for Wasingishu County and not as a deputy speaker sitting on the speaker's chair. You can only accuse me of bias if I make those statements from the speaker's chair. I am, all, I am first a member of parliament before I am deputy speaker. If the law contemplated a situation where I am gagged as deputy speaker, 
I would have been expected then by that law to resign like the substantive speaker does on that, in that case. And therefore now I want to proceed to go on to support the motion speaking as an ordinary member of Wasingishu County and not as deputy speaker. I want to, I have a few points to point out. The deputy speaker has, no, sorry, the deputy president has been engaged in various conducts that meet the threshold for impeachment. One, on numerous occasions, he has insisted that Kenya is a company of shares, and this is contrary to the Constitution Article 10 and also our, our national values. I also want to bring attention of the House that he has contravened his oath of allegiance. When he took his oath of allegiance, he says in full realization of the high calling, I assume as Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, I swear and affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the Republic of Kenya. The oath of allegiance does not mention Murima, it does not mention Mount Kenya, he bears allegiance to the Republic of Kenya, not to his wife and not to his sons. So he has gone against his oath of allegiance. I also want to go on to, uh, to refer to the press conference that the Deputy President held in Mombasa on the 20, 25th of June, 2024. In that particular press statement, he distanced himself from the Finance Bill 2024. As a member of Cabinet, in his position as Deputy President, he is collectively responsible for all the decisions that are made in cabinet and therefore in distancing himself he violated article 153 of the constitution the finance bill as we know is the overarching legislative document that underpins the revenue raising measures for the executive in order to achieve its programs if the deputy president did not agree with the decision of cabinet on the finance bill he ought to have held his peace and his tongue or resigned as a member of the cabinet. There is no two ways about it. And furthermore, by the mere fact of holding a presser at a time when the country was in crisis, when the president has addressed the nation, he went on to have his own one-man show of a presser. That is the greatest definition of gross misconduct. It is pure insubordination. No one can do that. I, it, is, it is unthinkable for a principal assistant to contradict the principal. If you want to contradict the principal, you resign your position and go and contradict them from outside. Thirdly, the deputy president also distance himself from the activities of the Nairobi Rivers Commission and claims that the, act and the, activi the activities were undertaken contrary to lo the law. The work of the commission was again endorsed by cabinet. The government followed laid down laws regarding eviction and resettlement of members of the public. The deputy president knows that this has been a crisis in this country and in contravention of the laws by having people uh, living by the repairs and so on. And in this year, people had actually died. And in order to prevent further deaths in future, cabinet in its wisdom decided to relocate the members of the public. And again, he, he again failed to take collective responsibility with cabinet, did not resign, but went on to countermand the decisions that had been made in cabinet. Furthermore, he has taken an oath of secrecy and therefore cannot publicly diverge what was decided in cabinet. Again, there he has contravened the law. Four, during the press conference in Mombasa on the 25th of June 2024, the deputy president accused the director general of NIS of providing faulty intelligence and firing some senior officers. As a state officer, and most importantly, as a member of the National Security Council. Under Article 240, the members of uh, the National Security Council 
at uh, clause 2B, the deputy president is a member. He, he then cannot discuss intelligence briefs that come to his knowledge during the proceedings of the National Security Council. Again, with that, he has gone against the Official Secrets Act and his oath of secrecy. And even if he had any reservations, he has opportunity as a member of the National Security Council to raise it at the Security Council proceedings and even to raise it to the president in person, but not to come as if he's an ordinary citizen who is in the opposition and then uh, speak about it in public. That is wrong. In fact, it is juvenile. It reveals him as a person who is unhinged and cannot control their tongue. Five, during the rally in Gidurai, Nairobi, which was presided over by the deputy president, with some members of parliament present, he was involved in leading chants that said Ruto must go. Ruta is a one-term president. He never denounced those statements. What that amounts to is that he is guilty of treason and other allied offenses. That is the penal code, section 40. And I will read it out, just that there is no doubt. It says that any person owing allegiance to the Republic of Kenya, or else of Kenya, um, if they if they compass, imagine, invent, dev devise any deeds with the intention of the death, the maiming, the wounding, the imprisonment, or restraint of the president is guilty of treason. So Rigadi Gashagwa is guilty of treason. And it also amounts to gross misconduct. So the deputy president cannot, therefore, expect to remain in his office as deputy president when his party to efforts to remove the president, to undermine the president, and to campaign against the president. He, his, his tenure as a principal assistant is not tenable by any interpretation or meaning. And six, during his appearance in church in Meru, the deputy president insinuated that if he is removed, the tribes of Kenya who are native to the Mount Kenya area will revolt and be violent. Again, that is treason and other allied offenses. And he also goes against the National Cohesion and Integration Commission Act with his utterances that relates to ethnic profiling. And even as late as yesterday, if I had any doubt in my mind that Rigadega Shagwa must be impeached and removed from office as Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, he made it very, very clear yesterday. Yesterday, he went on to disclose details of the Kenya Kwanzaa pre-election pact. This is contrary to non-disclosure agreements that were signed by parties. And without any due regard to these non-disclosure clauses, and without seeking consensus from other principals who are party to those pacts, he went on to sing like a parrot on national television. That is unbecoming behavior of a person who holds an office as high as that of the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. And lastly, I want to point out that all the violations that I have set out in support of this motion were brought upon and the evidence said by the Deputy President himself. This is not from anywhere. It's from his own very utterances. Practically, this is what the Deputy President has done. He has dosed paraffin on himself and he has lit the match all by himself without the help of anybody else. And so he has only himself to blame. I support this motion. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Adan Kainan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, from the onset, allow me to thank the Honorable Mutuse 
for being courageous, for being focused, and I'm sure in the annual of the history of this country, Mr. Speaker, and the history of the 13th Parliament, Mr. Mutuse, you will be appreciated. Mr. Speaker, having said that, I've also gone through uh, this impeachment clauses, Mr. Speaker. The 11 clauses, Mr. Speaker, are cogent, are rich in evidence, Mr. Speaker, and clearly demonstrate the actions, the omissions, the commissions of the Deputy President. Mr. Speaker, I've had an opportunity to reflect, because there's one thing that the DP has been using, that is a truthful man. I went back to the ironic definition, how a truthful man is supposed to be described in the Bible, in the Quran, in the civil society, Mr. Speaker. And in those definitions, Mr. Speaker, I have missed an iota of resemblance on anything that can, I can associate with those actions and the activities of the Deputy President, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, these clauses, we are a member of parliament. We, are, we as members of parliament, Mr. Speaker, our work is to protect the constitution. Our work is to oversight. And our work is to do one of these things that have been, have been demanded today by this impeachment, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in all these clauses, the common denominator is the DP has abused his office through corruption, through tender pre-learning, through disparaging and disobeying his boss, through undermining devolution, and Mr. Speaker, equally also by being a threat to our sovereignty. Mr. Speaker, this country is a collection of many nation states. The Kikuyu nation, the Somali nation, the Luya nation, and this is what we are proud of, Mr. Speaker, and this is what constitutes the sovereign republic of Kenya, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the other day, and I want to repeat this, and you will excuse me for saying this. This country has a very rich history. In 1982, one gallant son from northern Kenya called Gerald Mahmoud saved Kenyans from militarism. And I think we all appreciate it. He's still alive. Mr. Speaker, in 2007, another general by the name General Muhammad Ali saved the Kenyans from the effects of the political term, the social political term of 2007. And Mr. Speaker, the post-election violence. In 2024, another son from that region, Nurdin, has also saved this country from the effects and activities of Rigi and his cohorts, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that doesn't take away... That doesn't take away the contributions of many other Kenyans. Mr. Speaker, in all this, what I have gathered, and we have been in Parliament together, we, we are doing a favour for Rigi. We are doing a favour for the executive, members of the executive. We must save Rigi from the members of the executive, the other members, because he's a threat to their continued performance of their job, Mr. Speaker. We must also save Rigi from the members of the judiciary because he keeps on attacking them, Mr. Speaker. We must also save Rigi from the members of the legislature because he attacks them, Mr. Speaker. We must also save Rigi from the 47 tribes, Mr. Speaker, because he keeps on attacking them, Mr. Speaker. We must also save Rigi from the remnants of Mau Mau because he keeps on abusing their names, Mr. Speaker. We must save Rigi, Mr. Speaker, because he abuses our ladies, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we must also save Rigi from the people of Mount Kenya because he abuses their names and he wants to have them collide with other Kenyans, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I salute them, Mr. Speaker. And finally, on that aspect, we must save himself because last night when I watched that teleprompter driven press conference, Mr. Speaker, one thing that came to my mind is he was incriminating himself, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in all this, we have a president who has applied all his gingerly approach in managing the affairs of this nation, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, what is coming to mind is we have a DP who in every statement that he, that he utters abuses, uses the constitution wrongly, threatens, and demeans everybody. And it's because of this, Mr. Speaker, that we as a parliament, we must go in history and support this impeachment, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, finally, you have ruled on this. And I don't want my colleagues here actually to be threatened. What you are doing is right. Is this within your legislative right, Mr. Speaker, for those of us who have elected to support this by abandoning our signatures should also be available to vote today in our numbers to impeach 
Rigji, and by doing that, we'll be saving Kenya. I support Mr. Speaker. John Makali. John Makali. Yes, Give me the mic. For the opportunity you've granted me to also weigh in on this motion. Honorable Speaker, we are facing a constitutional moment where our constitution is being tested. At the outset, let me state that I have nothing as against the Deputy President or where he comes from. But Honorable Speaker, the Deputy President is not an ordinary person. The, ordinary, uh, the Deputy President is actually the second in command in our nation before he assumes office Article 74 of the Constitution requires him to take an oath of office. And Honorable Speaker, I've looked at the oath of office of the Deputy President. It requires him to be faithful to the Republic, to give counsel and advice to the President without fear or favor. Equally, the Deputy President is a ranking state officer, and Article 74 of the Constitution requires, Article 75 of the Constitution, requires that in the conduct of a state officer, he needs to bring honor and dignity to this office he holds. Honorable Speaker, looking at the grounds that have been availed, I want to state here categorically, Honorable Speaker, that the Deputy President has violated the Constitution and is out of office. Why do I say that, Honorable Speaker? One, the constitution of Kenya, which the people of Kenya gave to themselves, requires that Kenya is a unitary state, regardless of the regions it has. Equally, Article 10 of the constitution puts national unity, patriotism, as a key component of our national values in the discharge of our duties. Several other times, and I want to speak to this very clearly, Honorable Speaker, when the Deputy President, the truthful man he says he is, attended a church service in Bungoma, and we actually requested that we had several other problems which needed to be handled, specifically blocked road programs, employment opportunities, the Deputy President, the truthful man that he is, told us on our faces that according to the votes which we got, whatever we had gotten was enough and we had no duty to keep on asking for more projects. That is the deputy president who is supposed to be the principal assistant to the president and who is supposed to portray national unity. Equally, Honorable Speaker, the deputy president yesterday clearly said, clearly said that the government that we have now, the Kenya Kwanzaa government, is a government of shareholders. Because he said the government was formed because of shareholding agreements. Once you become a deputy president, you are the face of national unity. He cannot really keep invoking the promises which were made, the agreements which were made prior to the government being formed. What will happen to those, to those other, country, other, other, other areas which are not part and parcel of those particular agreements that were alleged to have been made? Equally, Honorable Speaker, the, the Deputy President has committed an offense or is reasonably expected to have committed an offense. When he was asked in his visits, which he makes throughout the country, he said that he visited Keio Marakwet, he visited other parts of the country, and he has been given animals. And those animals, he has kept them at his home, and he now has a herd. Article 76 of the Constitution clearly indicates that when you receive a gift or a donation, you are supposed to donate it back to the Republic. You don't keep it up as, as you are reward at home. So looking at this honorable speaker, the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya has committed a corruption offense for which he needs to go home. The honorable speaker, the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya is supposed to be above board. He is supposed to be the number two citizen who needs to preach national unity. He is supposed to be the president in waiting. He is supposed to be actually the president in waiting so that if anything happens, he is supposed to take over the reins of the country. Honorable Speaker, 
if we look at the utterances that have been made by the deputy president, let us look at the Kemsa case. I've looked at the affidavit of, 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 of Dr. Andrew. It is very, very clear that the deputy president was actually conflicted in the Kemsa supply case. And Article 75 of the Constitution requires all state officers to avoid situations where they are in conflict of interest. And in leading this, the deputy president should be at the forefront of avoiding situations where he falls in a situation where there's a conflict of interest. Taking into account all these grievance grounds that have been made, I have no doubt on my mind, Honorable Speaker, that for his arrogance, that for his breach of the Constitution, that for his defiance, that for his statements, that for his conduct, he is not a truthful man as he pretends to be, and we cannot have such a person as the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. It is high time, Honorable Speaker, that we now seize the dragon of tribalism, we now seize the dragon of ethnicity, we now seize the dragon of regionalism, and slay it, and get our nation moving forward. Honorable Speaker, I rise to support this particular motion and say the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya must go and we are start up a fresh page. I support Honorable Speaker. Julia Sole Sunguli. Um, Mr. Speaker, I come from a, an, old, an older period, being a, being a member of KANU, and uh, having served in the Kano government, and I find some things rather difficult to understand. Because, Mr. Speaker, this position of Deputy President is a new one. It came in 2010. The position of Vice President had very, very good gentlemen. I still recall the way the office was occupied by the Honorable, unfortunately late, George Saitoti, Kijana wa Malwa, and indeed, the fine gentleman that we have in politics now, Honorable Kalonzo Musioka. Um, those, those people, Mr. Speaker, understood their job. If I were to stand today and accuse um, the Honorable Gashakwa, I would accuse him of only one thing. He does not get it. The, the, this, this particular job, he does not know the job description of a vice, of a deputy president. For one, Mr. Speaker, the Constitution of Kenya says that there shall be a president. And then that president will be assisted by a deputy president. Now, assisted by a deputy president. That means, Mr. Speaker, that our Constitution foresees a situation where we have one driver and one makanga. And one is not trying to do the job of the other. Now, how did we get into a situation, Mr. Ch Mr. Speaker, where we now have two bosses in the country? We have the president, who, has been, who is the boss, and we have the deputy president, who says he's also the boss. Now, if there is something that we have to do in this, in this house, is to resolve that dispute. The country cannot run when we have... Give Wamchomba the mic. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I rise on a point of order to just ask whether the word Makanga is parliamentary. I just need a clarification. The word Makanga, whether it is parliamentary language. Is the member, is the member in order to use that kind of language uh, today? Uh, uh, Honorable Wamchomba. Order. There's... Yes, uh, Mili. Yes, Mili. I don't know if Honorable Sunkuli has allowed me to inform you. Yes, yes. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to inform Honorable uh, Sunkuli that you can use those words so long as you put in inverted commas because you are reporting. So when it is reported, uh, uh, like in the case where people are talking uh, Kufa Makanga, 
Kufa Dereva. Mr. Speaker, I even wanted to speak to it by saying that it is actually people saying that that are crucifying the DP. By saying he should Kufa, the, 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 the motion here is on the, in quotes, Makanga. It's not on the Dereva. So people want to bring the motion on the Dereva, in quotes, can bring, but the one we are dealing with now is on Makanga. But for Honorable Wamchomba, language is dynamic. It's living. It grows. That's why you now find Kiswahili words in the Oxford English Dictionary. And by ordinary usage, every single Kenyan knows what Makanga means. And uh, Sunguli was not mixing languages. He spoke in the manner like he was quoting. I will definitely need an extra time. But Mr. Speaker, so our constitution foresees a situation where the president and the deputy president operate in harmony. Now, Mr. Speaker, if your principal job is to, to assist the president and your marriage with the president is now irretrievably broken down, the only purpose of, the, of this house is to say that there is actually no more marriage and that the deputy president can no longer perform his duties as a, president, as a deputy president. And so, if that happens to be the situation, then why, what remains? I remember the late President Moi telling us that the problem with Africans is that they don't resign until they are kicked out. In this particular situation, because the marriage is irretrievably broken down, it ought to be the case that the deputy president ought to say, as a gentleman, that this thing is not working, I'm going to leave it. He has said that this is like a company. And in a company, people exist in order to have a common good. And the mixture of strategy and vision and deep understanding of their core business is what will bring uh, fruit to this job. Mr. Speaker, I believe myself that there are two mistakes that have been made here that need to be looked into by this House. One is that the Deputy President ought to believe in the Republic of Kenya. Because if I look at the number of times, if I Google the number of times the Deputy President has pronounced the word Mount Kenya, and the number of times he has pronounced the name Kenya, the number of times he has said Mount Kenya are more than the days that times he has said, the, the, has said Kenya. This, a person who takes the oath to be the Deputy President of Kenya must be a person who pronounces the, word Mount, the words Kenya more than the one person who pronounces the words of his region. Patriotism. And secondly, the person must actually believe in his boss and must... Give him one minute. Wind Mr. Speaker. Up. If your core business is to support, is to work for your boss, you must believe in him. If you don't believe in him, what are you doing with him? The second thing is that you must believe in Kenya. If you don't believe in Kenya, that you believe that your responsibility is to look after the shares of your, of, of, of your side of Kenya, then what, is, what are you doing with the rest of the, of the country? Mr. Speaker, I want to finish by urging that next time we appoint a deputy president, Next time the president appoints the deputy president, let him understand that that is a serious business. You must appoint a person who will actually understand that he's going to be a president if something bad happens. Don't do it just because he brings votes. He brings votes. Let us be serious about this responsibility because that is where we are, we are going wrong. Someone is saying that he qualifies just because he brought in the votes, not because he can actually appeal to the rest of the Kenyans and can be trusted by the rest of Kenyans. I therefore, Mr. Speaker, vote to impeach. Osoro. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I, from the onset, I want to state that I support this motion entirely without uh, putting or proposing to put a comma or full stop on any ground that has been placed, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I want to remind the Honorable Members that uh, 
Clinton, Clinton was almost impeached, or the impeachment attempt against Clinton in 1998 was out of the Monica Lewinsky. Read your, uh, hist read your history properly, he was actually impeached. Exactly. Monica Lewinsky matter. Of course, it was overturned later by the courts and other issues, but I'm saying it was out of that scandal, the very small scandal of uh, the sexual scandal in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, White House. Honorable Speaker, I want first to start by proposing this question, Honorable Speaker, to Honorable Members. How would you feel that when you eventually transit to the next world, you are dead, that your brother or the person that you choose to entrust to take care of your wife and your children's property decides to start using those property for his own personal use as members. How would you feel that? That is the question that honorable members should be making, that uh, should be answering themselves before they vote today, later today, honorable speaker. Honorable speaker, the late governor, Deritu Gashagwa, passed on on 24th of February, 2017. Between 2017, Honorable Speaker, to 2024, it is indeed true that the late governor then, amongst uh, Mwai, Madenge, and Jeroge, he appointed, he entrusted Mr. Rigadi, the Deputy President, as the executor of his will. But Honorable Speaker, between 2017 and 2024, the property that, and this is, Honorable Speaker, is in the documents that Mwengi uh, Mutusa has shared, Honorable Mwengi Mutusa has shared with us uh, and tabled in this house, that between 2017 and 2024, he's been able to alter or tamper with those companies, make himself directors in some of those companies, transfer some of those properties to himself, disinherit the some of the beneficiaries, the kids of the late, and put them to himself. And then one particular case, Honorable Speaker, is the Olive Garden Realtors, Honorable Speaker, that was actually uh, altered on 2nd of March 2022, using the position of power to his own advantage, Honorable Speaker. How can you explain that? He will then tell you, Honorable Speaker, that you know I bought its willing buyer, willing seller. Really? Does it mean that all your money that you've acquired, which is also questionable, the only property that you could identify is the property that is under the care or is supposed to, to, to help the family and the widows of, the late, of your late brother? How wicked can we be? Then you come in full glare of camera and tell the members of the public that please let my brother rest in peace. I decided to hold this property in trust for them when the brother, the kids, the widows, and the daughters and sons of the late are languishing in poverty and complaining and crying. It is total shame. You, you, you cannot use your position for that. Honorable Speaker, these are practical examples. And I'm telling my honorable members to acquit themselves and go through uh, ground seven, honorable speaker. It is actually on page 16 to 30. This is this is nothing but gross violation of the law, Honorable Speaker, taking advantage of their own power, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, and you know, even to prove that, you will realize that those companies, by the time the companies were being, some of them were being registered, the new ones, and the time the, 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 the transfer of these properties were taking place, Honorable Speaker, the whole thing is actually contemporaneous. You need not to be a rocket scientist to know that clearly this is fraud and this is a... Uh, um, um, this was taking advantage of the, the, of the late. I want to invite, to, I want to remind the Honorable Deputy President of the good book in the book of uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 25, that the Lord will tear, that's what the Bible says, that the Lord will, will, will tear down the house of the proud, but he will establish the boundary of the widow. That is why we are here today. If there is no other reason that has brought us here, Honorable Speaker, it is to protect the family that is being disinherited of their property under coercion, blackmail, and threats. If there is no other reason, Honorable Speaker. And that is why, Honorable Speaker, even it, it's actually biblical again, in the good book, Honorable Speaker, of uh, the book of Exodus 22, 22, that do not take advantage of the widow, do not take advantage of the fatherless. If you do, and they cry to me, I will certainly 
hear their cry. And my anger will be aroused and I will kill you with the sword. Today, we are using the sword today here to protect, and it is biblical, it is religious. Today, we are using the sword to impeach you, just to protect the children that are suffering, that you threatened, that you blackmailed, that you told that if you dare speak, if you dare speak or utter a word, I am the deputy president of Kenya, elected by 7.2 million people. I will finish you. Finish who? We will finish you today in this floor of the house. Honorable Speaker, I mean, it, it, there is... There is nothing more, for me, Honorable Speaker, on this matter, there is nothing more than cabinalism. I mean, really, like you are left under the care of the properties of your brother. Then you take them to your advantage. You are immediate brother. Then on TV you tell us that, you know, in the will, my brother gave me, and then he gave my wife, then he gave my sons. Where, what about his children? What about his widows? What about his sons? What about, how proudly can you say that you are only enjoying the property of your brother? For that reason alone, Honorable Speaker, we say Gashagwa must go. If there is no other reason, today Gashagwa must go. Honorable Speaker, I relate this case with the case of, uh, I relate this matter, Honorable Speaker, with the Sp uh, Speluncian Explorers case, Honorable Speaker, where the members... Yes, uh, Kipchumba. Timothy Kipchumba. Honorable Speaker, I rise past one to standing order number 91 on the issue of statement of facts. Honorable Speaker, is it in order for the Honorable Soro to claim that the Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa disinherited the wife of the late brother? Honorable Speaker, can he table the facts before this house that he disinherited? Uh, Honorable Order, Honorable Kipchumba, order. Order Osoro, Honorable Kipchumba, those are the facts that the move of the motion placed on the table. It appears you probably were not in the house then. Finish up, Osoro. Honorable Speaker, I will refer the Honorable Member to pages 16 to 30 of this very motion that was tabled in this house, Honorable Speaker. And these are facts. And I've also said that, Honorable Speaker, on this particular matter, the threshold is on the two-third, and we're also working on the balance of probability. We are looking at this matter on how the facts relate or place themselves on the table from the transfer of the properties and also the registration of the companies. I mean, it is clear the facts are contemporaneous. Nobody, Nobody unless you don't need to be a rocket scientist to identify this whole thing, Honorable Speaker. And that is why, Honorable Speaker, for this reason, for this very reason, Honorable Speaker, I want to say that I support the impeachment. Please let's make it early. Even if it's at six, Rigathi Gashagwa must go. TJ Kajwang will be the last for the morning. Uh, Mr. Speaker, just confirm to me that uh, I can see that there is one minute to the hour. Thank you very much. M M Mr. Speaker, I rise for a very simple reason, uh, that uh, if there is any member who came in this chamber uh, believing that uh, we or the members are uh, Order. Go going to impeach uh, the deputy president without reason, they can listen to us and we can give them the reasons why we stand noonday to make this presentation. First of all, Member for Machakos County, what is the problem? What about the descending voices, Shuan? The speaker has no way of knowing who is descending. <laughs> yes. Go on, Kajuang. Yes. <laughs> yes.
Yes, Mbuzia, what is the problem? Mr. Speaker, TJ Kajuang, one minute. I, I have come uh, to make a very small presentation as the member of Ruaraka. First of all, having seen that the motion has been signed by 291 members, this house, single constituencies are 290. If 291 have signed and will vote, Gachagua must go. Yes. Number two, we have not come here to vilify anybody. We have come here with facts, we have come here with evidence, and we have come here with a law. I want to be in a country where my son and my daughter, if he qualifies and if he's, if he's eligible, will get employment, will do business, will walk proud and tall. Not because he comes from Waondo village in Nyanza, but because she or he is eligible. This politics of everybody must come from Mount Kenya. Mount Kenya. Usiguze mrima. Usiguze mrima. We must show, Mr. Speaker, uh, that this country is for us all. We must show, Mr. Speaker, that there are no people who are entitled more than the others. That there are people who fought for Maumau more than the others. Or that there are people who are more populated than others. And so, this idea that they work for Kenya Kwanzaa government and that they must eat, it is their time to eat. This deputy uh, president, his, his, his mentality is that he got votes for uh, President Ruto and so it is his time to eat. For that reason only, I would vote because I want a situation after we, do, after we are through with elections, everybody, including me, is served because I pay taxes like everybody else. For the deputy speaker to go yes, to... Yes, Jomba. There's a point of order. Mr. Speaker, is the member on the floor... Which order? Mr. Speaker, I'm addressing Mr. Speaker. You are not the speaker. I am addressing Mr. Speaker. Stop heckling. You are not the speaker. I'm addressing the speaker. Go ahead. Mr. Speaker, is the member Honorable Kajiang on order, in order to say that there is a mentality that the deputy president has a mentality to eat? Does he have any gadget to mention mentality? Is that a fact? Can you prove? Can you prove that there is a mentality? Which gadget do you use to measure mentality? Go on. Check. Check, check. Uh, Mr. Speaker, first of all, first of all, pronounce my name properly. I'm not Kachechua. I am Kajuang, not Kanjuang. Number two, Mr. Speaker, uh, this is a problem. Everybody, I, I heard them call it Raira, Kanjuang. They do, some of you must learn that we are in a country for everybody. Nobody is powerful than the other. Nobody comes from a section of community. Today we will show that this country is for everybody. Yes. Mr. Speaker, there must be hygiene in leadership. There must be hygiene. You cannot, you cannot trade with government. And you are the deputy speaker. The deputy president. Sorry, sorry. You cannot trade with government. And then you are the deputy president. You cannot trade with government and you are a state officer. Even you who are sitting here. Stop, stop, stop trading with government. So that you only have one work which is an elected member of this house. So evidence has been laid before us. And we are clear on page 16 of this evidence that him and his family, first of all, he thinks that uh, his family, uh, it is all right if his family trades with the government. He has not read 
the Leadership and Integrity Act. You, yourself, your wife, your mother, your, your son, your daughter must not trade with government so that we allow uh, enterprises to grow out there. Mr. Speaker, only on that basis, I think that there is a situation here which we must save. The third one, Mr. Speaker, he is principal assistant to the president. If we don't deal with this, this, this thing today, all vice presidents or deputy presidents will think that the president is age mate. There must be a distinction between a president and a deputy president. This one, at least the president has allowed him to chair the cabinet. At least the president has allowed him to be the chairman of IBEC. Now, well, the, the law has allowed him to be uh, the chairman of IBEC. What would happen if, as the chairman of IBEC, he is only giving uh, budget allocations to people from Rima? Huh? What would happen if he is the chairman of IBEC only giving budget allocations to people of his family? Mr. Mr. Speaker, the last thing I want to say, this presidency as it is, is so dysfunctional that even if we left it today, there would be a problem in presidency in such a manner that would uh, undermine national integrity and national security. I, I don't need the information. I just have one minute to go. Thank you. Finish up. Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Speaker, we, don't, we are not going to impeach him because of uh, what uh, that speaker had talked about, that uh, we are lynching or that it's a mob. We have carefully considered, and the law is that uh, we are not talking about civil liability or culpability. We are talking about accountability. We are talking about political governance and political responsibility. And so all those things that he has said out there, he must take responsibility for. And we are politicians. We are not a court of law. He will be tried in Senate. Ours is just to initiate this process. And the Senate will ask very pertinent question. He is saying that uh, all these things he, he, he got from his brother and so on. They will investigate and find out did he pay tax for them? When he came, when he filed this uh, report and said that uh, he's worth so much, did he say that he also got something from his brother? Now, no, it is not here. You don't know. This thing is asked in the Senate. It is the Senate that is the trial chairman and the investigating. So the Senate will also ask, will also ask his uh, return forms. He's also re-asked the KRA forms if this information are consistent. And so, in all the evidence that I've seen, in all the charges I've seen, I return a verdict that Gachagua must do what? Gachagua must do what? Gachagua must do what? Order members, will you be upstanding? Order, honorable members. It is now 109, and the House stands adjourned until 2.30 this afternoon. used his office as the deputy president
called junior officers at the Ministry of Lands, forced them to forge documents to the effect that Wamunyoro Investment had bought the land in Embakasi long even before it had been registered as a company. That land, that land, Mr. Speaker, belongs to a sickly civil servant. It belongs to a father, it belongs to a mother. Mr. Speaker, we must have a deputy president who is compassionate. I watched the deputy president yesterday on television displaying impunity and arrogance. He told Kenya, yes, I have said Kenya is a company, Mutadu, 